Everyone, Dave puts here from JKP Holdings alongside me, as always, Mr. Nathan Turner. Good day, good day. How are you? Yeah, uh, I'm doing a whole lot better. Um, I'm sure um, last week my voice was a little bit crazy, um, frustratingly crazy, but yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. So, I, as some people know, I ended up testing positive on Saturday with this COVID stuff. Um, I ended up watching TV for most of the, the weekend, just because I couldn't get out of bed. So, <laughs> emails piled up. Yeah, got back to it. It's all good. It's all good. Um, we've seen some some movement uh, on some assets recently that is changing things. Um, courts are starting to open back up for us, which is good. Yeah. Um, trustees are starting to respond to things. Um, little things are starting to work out, which is what we look for. Yeah. That trickling starting to process. Um, we, I didn't submit any offers this week because I'll be going away for the next couple of days. Um, so I, I kind of held off on that stuff. So due diligence isn't going to be crazy. Good. Um, good. How about you guys? How, what's going on over there? Uh, actually, that reminds me, I got to send out a wire today on a new one that I just purchased. So nice. Um, yeah, it's a good one out in um, Anderson, Indiana, okay. and paid fifty five for it. Uh, house is worth. I was surprised when I got the BPO back, um, and and we've had this discussion about BPOs. Go watch that video. But uh, yeah. I was surprised the value was better than I expected. Um, I thought maybe one fifty. The realtor there says one eighty, maybe, maybe not. But uh, unpaid balance, payoff balance is about ninety thousand. So this little very likely sell at auction uh and I, that's still a, a great profit for me i'm very happy with that so i'm assuming it's unoccupied unoccupied yeah this is this is we we touched on this i think last time uh this is a reverse mortgage where a, a lot of people are are yeah, leery I about those them. and i i get it but i like them yeah i like them I, i'm just not sure about it but that's my problem I think, right um i just don't know if i trust what i trust yeah um, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes, right? Um, so those who don't know reverse mortgages, basically the person's dead, right? Yeah, right? They took out a reverse mortgage. They passed away. Obviously not paying the bill no more. Um, and typically it's a simple, you're going to foreclose on it situation. So yeah, it's there's really not very much of an option. Uh, it's it's a foreclosure play and, and that's fine. And if the numbers work, great. And yeah. in this case, I think the numbers are very favorable. So I'm, I'm happy with this one. Um, I did post on our, our website, our Facebook group and all stuff. We came out with a uh, partials calculator for those who are interested in partials. Um, not only does it do partials, but it, it also calculates if you're looking for like what my return would be or what how many payments or it's similar to the HP calculators, um, but it's a spreadsheet format. And for me, the visual look of it is easier. So mm -hmm. you can go on to it. Uh, one of the posts, all we ask you to do is jump on our due diligence portal, run a free address, just we're just trying to get some feedback on there. And with that, we'll send you over a spreadsheet. You plug in some numbers. It has schedule A, B, and C. Uh, I did tag on uh, our guest today. She actually uh, didn't know it, but she helped me out figure out some of the stuff. Um, so for those who love calculators, ju definitely jump on the HP calculators. If you're more of a visual learner, um, reach out and we'll get you hooked up with that. Um, just run a few assets to our due diligence portal or find an REO agent, local to a property or whatnot. So yeah, yeah. Nathan, awesome. what we're finding now is notes are highly priced. They're just extremely high yep. compared to what we used to. Yep. Um, there's deals that be, to be had and yep. banks and some of that are just as fiscal as we are, right? Yes. <sighs> there are people out there that are not as fiscal as we are that actually, for one reason or another, create a note yeah yeah it happens all the time it, it's funny when i first got started in notes being from canada i thought i'd invented seller financing <laughs> i thought I mean, this is a great idea man nobody's ever done this and uh, started selling properties on terms that that's how we termed it back then didn't even know it was called notes had no idea it was called seller financing <laughs> had well, no good idea job. the godfather yeah. of seller financing <laughs> So, but it's um, it's it's very common. Um, people will do that. They'll have a whatever an income property. Yeah. Um, a lot of people see it as a good option uh, instead of renting. And I agree uh, personally. I I prefer 
a seller finance deal than I do a rental. And, and there's pros and cons, but that's for another story, perhaps. Yeah. It's interesting because seller financing, for some investors, they get into it to the trustees and they go seller finance to begin with, and they have no clue about the other side of it. And they have other investors who come in from our side of it and don't have a clue about the seller financing world. Yeah. Um, certain states, it's much easier to do in or higher demand in, right? Yeah. Um, so it's, but what people don't realize is there is a lot of education to buying these assets versus get a list, go with it and, and make offers. Right. What I was fascinated by, and we definitely reach out is with everything being so hot in the market and mm -hmm. loans being flying around. Mm -hmm. If someone asked me three weeks ago, what do you think that the report was for seller financing last year? I'd probably tell you down. I couldn't see possibly yeah. seller financing being up because it's usually it's a need situation where I can't, I don't, I don't know how to. I, yeah. The house isn't valued high enough. Houses were extremely high in value. Right. So I was quite amazed to hear that the seller financing world was as popular in 2021 than ever before. I, I was astonished by that. What's yeah. your thoughts? So I agree because, you know, we're just coming out of like late 2020 or mm -hmm. sorry, going into right before and even the beginning of COVID, we're talking about like uh, interest rates were down at the floor and everyone was getting refinanced. Yeah. Everybody was getting refinanced. So, so what's the incentive then? Like, why would anybody do a seller finance deal um, yep. when bank financing was so cheap? Yeah. However... The numbers say different. So this would be interesting to go through this today and see what so we can learn. So I'm going to bring on our special guest and welcome Tracy to our uh, Friday Live special, right? Um, Tracy, welcome. Thank you for joining us on our gorgeous Friday afternoon. Hopefully it's gorgeous down near you. Yeah. It absolutely is. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So Tracy, before we get into all the nitty gritty and stuff like that, so for those who don't know you, can you give a little bit of background on who you are? How did you get into notes? How long have you been doing it? And what did you do before notes? I come from a rural area and I worked for an attorney that did title, that did closings, that did escrow servicing. And that was my background. And then I moved to the big city, which was Spokane, Washington. And I went to work for a company that bought seller financed notes. And that was in 1988. And they'd already been doing that for since the 40s and 50s. Wow. They would buy seller financed paper at a discount. And so I applied what I knew to that. And I worked in that institutional land, as I call it, for about 10 years. And they bought notes, seller financed notes all over the United States, and they bought them at a discount. And then after about 10 years of that, I, I decided I wanted to venture out on my own because I was buying real estate. We weren't allowed to buy notes when we worked there because it was considered a conflict of interest, understandably. Mm -hmm. So we could buy and sell real estate. We could use seller financing for our own properties, but not to buy notes. And I quickly realized it did not want to be a landlord. I wanted to be a lien lord. And so when I left there, then I started referring some notes still to that company I used to work for and then buying some as I had funds available and buying them in a self-directed retirement account because I rolled over my 401k into self-directed retirement account. So for the last 20 years, my husband and I, that's what we've been doing as well as we share blogs and information and we love the stats. So I've always been on the seller financing side. It was when you talked about people coming from the buying the non-performing note side, that was new to me after the 08 crash, right? That was a little bit different in the market than what we all survived on before. And so the seller financing world just, you know, it, it kind of ebbs and flows depending on what's going on in the conventional lending in the real estate market, which we're here to talk about today. Mm -hmm. You're on mute, Dave. Uh, for those who don't know who Tracy is, the, the website she has has been around for a long time. Wealth and Odds, her husband is just as good, right? So definitely check out knowninvestor.com uh, website. It, all the information. It's amazing how people get into this space by the way they do it, right? Um, it most commonly, I think, is I don't want to be a landlord. I don't want to <laughs> own this property. Um or you did own it and you're like, I don't want to do it landlord again, which I fell into. Um, so it's interesting that we all come from that same kind of mindset. But I think that a lot of what you're going to talk about today 
is based on where you live, right? Where up in New Jersey, we don't get a lot of self-financing as much as you guys do where you mm -hmm. guys are located. Mm -hmm. That's very true. It's, it happens to be very regional. Regional. The great thing is, it's just like buying notes, buying seller finance notes. You don't have to be in the location. Yeah. So you can take this information and apply it no matter where you live. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So and I agree. This, it is very regional. Like, like you say, Dave, in, in Northeastern United States, it's very, very rare. Uh, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, all the time land contracts they're called out there and that's what i got started in and it just depends on where you are in, in the country so tracy you know what you, what i thought was really cool was your ability to understand this stuff um and, and really kind of um bring to light what this all means so i just want to give me one second Well, I think the first place to start is what is seller financing? You guys in the intro talked about it. It's where somebody owns a piece of property, they're on deed, they, they own it, their fee simple title, and they sell it to someone and they allow that buyer to make payments to them instead of going out and getting a bank loan. Mm -hmm. Now, these stats are first position, seller financed over 30,000 that are of record. So these are things that you can pull from the county courthouse. So it might be a deed of trust and mortgage, it might, or a deed of trust, it might be a mortgage, it might be a recorded contract for deed, but it doesn't record, uh, account for unrecorded contract for deed. So if you think about seconds and unrecorded contract for deeds and things under 30,000, the numbers could even be bigger, but this is kind of what we consider to be the most sellable in the secondary market. Yep. I'm just going to just adjusting my screen real quick, guys. I apologize for those that are watching live. Uh, I didn't actually have it set up for a presentation on my uh, streaming thing, so I'm just going to move things over here. Hopefully, everyone can see it okay, and uh, we'll go from there. So, can you? It's interesting you say that, Tracy. Uh, sorry, Dave. One sec. Just sure. I, you say like the ones that have been recorded, the ones on record. So when I first started, we were doing these land contracts in Ohio. At the time, I don't think that you were required to record them, so we didn't. And, and that was strategic because we said, well, if it's not on record, then we don't have to go through the whole process uh, with the courts and everything. And so it was very much on purpose. So I, I believe that there are gonna be um, quite a few more than, than whatever the numbers are that you have. I would agree in certain regions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So now, are you guys able to see my screen now? Yes, so Tracy, Excellent. how long have you been looking at these reports for, how many years have you kind of Run numbers. Uh, I think 2009 is when I started working with advanced seller data services to get the data. So we've been adding to it every year. Um, so I work closely with Scott Arpan at advanced seller data services, and he pulls the raw data because he has the ability he uh, to pull from the county courthouse records. And then I give him some guidelines and he comes up with some great things too, because he's been in the business a long time. And then he gives us the data and then we put it into a report. Awesome. Cool. So let's, let's rock and roll here, right? All right. Let's see what we got. Well, in 2021, there was 27.3 billion with a B dollar volume of seller carry notes that meet those parameters that we talked about. What's a seller carry note? That's a big number in one year, in 2021. So these come out usually March to April. We get them uh, just because it takes that long. There's some counties that have trailing records. Uh, and so what was interesting was that it was a 15.9% increase in dollar volume. Now that in itself might not be too surprising because everything's going up in value, right? Every property has seen appreciation. So you might say, well, the seller financing just stayed the same. The dollar volume might have just gone up. But what was surprising to me as it was to you in this hot real estate market, the number of seller finance deals went up by 7%. So not only was a dollar volume increase, there was a count increase. So you might be surprised and we'll unravel this a little bit, but so even in these hot markets where people are offering cash, over asking, no contingencies, money is cheap, there is still an increase in seller financing. And these are newly originated in 2021? Yes. Wow. January through December of 2021. You know, we should have actually had a pop quiz. How many money was generated by seller finance? I don't know if anyone would ever guess billion dollars. No. 
We should have a pop quiz now. I, I, I don't think anyone would ever guess that number. Yeah, that'd be a fun poll, wouldn't it? Before, yeah, before the reveal. I would say if I were to take a guess, I don't know, like me. I would have said maybe a billion, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking like just around the number. I, I can I can see over you know 750 billion. I would say yeah. I think I would say around if I had to look at it, billion or two billion, if that. I remember the first time we started adding them all up. I'm like, I'm getting it out. Like, oh, my calculator's numbers don't go out that far. I'm like, I got to do this. Like, my brain was having troubles wrapping around the billion, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh my lord. So it's really interesting wow. when you take a look, this chart shows it by count over time. So you'd asked uh, seller financing usage. We started tracking it this way since about 2009. And we'll come back to this later and along with some mortgage availability, but you can just see that by count, this is by dollar volume. We did by count just so you can get a general feel. There was a lot of seller financing in 2013, 14, 15, 2012. That was all after that subprime mortgage meltdown. And so we know that credit was really tight then. It's hard to get loans. And seller financing really moved in and took the place. And then as the real estate markets picked up and the conventional banking got uh, more back in line with what they used to do, then we saw seller financing numbers go down as we would expect but you know they kind of bumped along and then they bumped back up in 2021 interesting so this number here just kind of shows the last five years so i pulled out the last five years and you can just see them broken down by residential commercial land and there's there's category of unknown meaning that the county didn't make it easily identifiable when they pulled the records what the property type was. So we just stuck it in an unknown bucket. Fortunately, in 2021, that bucket got a lot less, a lot smaller. So mm -hmm. when you add up the last five years of volume, there's over 123 billion in the past five years. So why do I think that's important? Because I market to seller financing notes and sometimes we'll buy a note for somebody who's had it for seven, eight, nine, 10 years. But on average, we don't market back too much past five years because we see a lot of refinancing or people yep. selling properties. And you know, a lot of times they'll have already, the note will paid off or they've sold the note. So to me, this is kind of like the availability in the seller finance market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the number gets even bigger, right? When you add it all up. Yeah. So if you look at residential, that made up about 53% of that uh, number in uh, last year and in count, it made up about 61%. And then of course there's some commercial, that's seller finance. That was about 26% of the dollar count, 16 of the, just the count. And then land, uh, that's a big one as well. So it made up about 14% of the dollar. And then we had that little bit of unknown category that I mentioned. And I think it's safe to say that it's probably a similar makeup as the other categories. So that's kind of how it all shook out um, when you look at residential commercial land, those three main categories. Hmm. Does anything surprise you guys there? Or, eh. You know, I don't think I actually thought too much about commercial property being self financed, but I guess it's probably a lot because you figure if someone getting in the space is willing to sell in a retiring kind of thing, um, mm -hmm. I would think that'd probably be more anything else. I see residential more as like, hey, my parents passed away or something happened and I got this property. I, I want to sell it and self financing some way of doing it. Um, yeah. So it could be any kind of property type, right? You know, seller financing happens because there's a need right. that's not met by conventional financing. So either the property maybe was having troubles qualifying or the person was having troubles qualifying. And that could be because of down payment or credit or a lot of self-employed people have troubles uh, without get, having W-2 income. So there's all kinds of reasons. There are some category, and we'll get into it later, of people who do this professionally. They on purpose create seller finance notes. So we kind of divide it up between the mom and pop, like you said, somebody who maybe didn't necessarily want to, but they did, or the professional seller that does that. So then these are, are these just like contracts for deed or is this like a private mortgage? So this would be any type of mortgage, deed to trust or contract for deed where the seller sold the property, gave a deed and immediately took back a lien instrument. So they wouldn't be private loans, like where sometimes you'll see an IRA loan privately or you'll see the private lender to a hard money lender. It wouldn't include those. It would only include 
where somebody was on title as the owner, gave a deed and then immediately took back a purchase money deed of trust or purchase money mortgage, or they did a contract for deed where they haven't done the deed yet. So any of those types. Okay. But not, not private lenders for. That's right. Not that private kind of lenders. Yeah. Okay. They had to be on the property as the owner at the yeah. same time the note was created to qualify for the stats. So wow. this might surprise most people. It always surprises me, but the <clears throat> average loan to value for the seller finance deal, and this was just calculated in the states where they disclose the sales price. There are some states that don't do that in the, in the public records, but it, the average down payment was 23% because the average loan to value is 77%. So what a nice big down payment. Everybody thinks seller financing is zero down. There's certainly some of those, but it's not all of them. And the average balance was 269,201. That was a huge increase from 2020. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of ideas why that might have been. Uh, that was one of the numbers that surprised us the most. But uh, the, the down payment, it's always, you know, between 20 to 25 percent down payment on the residential side. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I just I just did one of those myself. Like uh, the one I just told you, I just got listed yeah. uh, for sale right now. It was a 20% down payment, which was Good. more than I was actually asking for. I was asking for 10 and they had it. So for heaven's sakes, I'll take it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we find that anything less than 10 increases the chance of default in the future substantially. Agreed. Yeah. 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 So so some quick questions that people have. Cindy asked a question. Um, is residential seller financing um, Due to uh, a byproduct of COVID, of like loss of jobs, do you think? So there's always a certain amount of seller financing, as the graph showed. So it kind of goes up and down depending on the restriction of credit. And at the end, we're going to look at the mortgage availability index that's published by the MBA, and you'll see that they are tightening their lending criteria, mm. which we think is what contributed to this. And they did mm -hmm. start tightening their lending criteria when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really great observation. That's about when you see it drop huge. Uh, and so, yes, I, I do think it's because the banks started tightening up their criteria on down payment, minimum credit score, uh, and some other things uh, with income, proof of income. And now we're going to see, as we'll look in our predictions, that interest rates are going up, right? So fewer people are going to qualify because their payment's going to go up. So we'll talk gotcha. a little bit about that too. So with commercial, we see that it was about an average of 71% loan to value. The average size, uh, note size was 495,266. And then for land, uh, the average note size is 233,000. And they had a 70% average loan to value. So almost a 30% down payment on land, which makes sense. It's a risk here. You know, as the risk goes up, people know usually to get a more of a down payment. So commercial and land would be considered riskier, known investments than residential. So this is one of my favorite charts. Where in the world do they do seller financing? <laughs> so every year since we've been tracking it, Texas, and we do this by count, so it's not skewed by the dollar amounts of what properties cost in areas, but Texas is normally the top producing. So they produced about 23%. Uh, California and Florida usually switch back and forth between second and third. Uh, people are always surprised they actually do seller financing in California, but they do. Florida, where I currently reside, number three. Uh, let's see, number four was North Carolina this time. Arizona, five. Six was Georgia. Seven was Washington. Uh, eight was New York, nine, believe it or not. A lot of it's upstate New York. And nine was Tennessee and 10 was Oregon. And then all states have a little bit of seller financing. So on our website that you mentioned uh, earlier, noteinvestor.com, if you wanna see all 50 states, you can download the report. But these 10 states have made up almost 70% of the volume. Wow. Holy goodness. Yeah. So, so if you're great. looking to try to get seller financing, focus yeah. on these states, right? That's yeah. the whole point of this, is that these are states are hitting hard. I mean, Texas has always been number one in my yeah. book. Of where to look for self finance notes. I'm even surprised by Florida. Um, yeah, that's true. I because contracts for deeds don't fly, so it, they'll all be mortgages. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it tends to be in Florida a lot of land, mobile and land. Okay. 
Uh, this would include any mobile onlys in parks because they're not considered real estate, so they don't qualify for what we pull on these numbers. Oh, yeah, because they're car. So, uh, yeah, so those don't, but mobile and land would be in there when the land and the mobile were sold. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Texas is always the big state. You know, we often talk about why is that? And, you know, I think a lot of it just comes with what people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you see other people doing it, they, they do it themselves, it becomes more normal, it becomes more obvious. There are also certain states that tend to have a bigger demographic that has troubles qualifying for conventional financing. <clears throat> so we see a lot of seller financing with the people like ITIN buyers, uh, people maybe who get paid cash and that sort of thing. And so sometimes that is part of it too. People come from other countries whether legally or not. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that that sort of plays into it as well. Do you, do you track how much commercial versus residential or are there states where there's more often commercial properties sort of financed than residential? You know, we can break that down. We haven't done that to that degree. I mean, when we pull the number, the, the lists ourselves to market to them, then we get that detailed. Like we'll sure. decide whether we want to just pull a list of residential or just mobile home and land or just commercial because we tend to market to them a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be, a, that's maybe a great addition, at least for these top three or four states, right? Yeah, because, you know, uh, Cody, made a comment that he finds in Oregon that most of the seller clients are actually se seller carry seconds. That's yeah. Interesting. Now, interesting, these numbers don't include the seller carry seconds. If it was a wrap where the seller remained responsible for the first, they're included in this. But if it was a true second, like 80-10-10, uh, where maybe they mm -hmm. got a 80% bank loan, a 10% down payment, a 10% second from the seller, these numbers don't include those. So though it's, those would be additional. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chewy. Yeah. So I always like to break down the note creators into mom and pop. Somebody who creates one note in a 12 month period mm -hmm. and somebody who creates two or more. So 84% mm -hmm. of that volume was created by mom and pop sellers who only did one note in 12 mm -hmm. months. And the other 16% of the volume was created by somebody who did two or more in that 12 month period. And then we go just a little bit further and we say out of that 16% that created two or more, we see about 9% of the whole, so half of that 16 almost, created two to three notes. And the rest were created by somebody who did four or more notes. So those are really professional. So 7% yeah. of the whole 100% were created by people who did four or more notes. And we look at that a lot because of Dodd-Frank, right? When Dodd-Frank yeah. hit, they said, if you did seller financing one in 12 months, you met a certain exemption. Great. If you did um, three or under, you met another exemption. And then over four, you didn't need an exemption. So you've got, we kind of track that because we kind of like to see what happened with that. And there, it, we didn't have as many professional sellers there for a while, right after Dodd-Frank. And then they kind of picked back up. Mm -hmm. Once they figured out how to do it. So what I, we're diving into some sort of finance stuff and pulling data. And what I found to be extremely frustrating is that a lot of times you pull this data down and the names of the county records are incorrect. Meaning, you know, Bank of America is not one we want to care about, but you may see it as instead of Bank of America, it may say B-N-A-K because it misscanned in there. Are you guys able to do a good job of filtering out these inaccurate Bank of America where it's BOA, B.OA, and then it's the same entity, but it's just screwed up in the, in the processing? Yeah, we feel Scott does a really good job of that because uh, they, they had to be uh, owner on the deed first. So they had to give the deed and take back financing gotcha. at the same time and not have that kind of a name. Now on these uh, professional sellers, they still have to own the property, but sometimes they do have entity names. They might be a trust or an LLC, sure. uh, but normally the one off mom and pops are just uh, individual names. Uh, so, but the, the reason that the filter works is because they had to own the property and sell it and immediately take back the financing. Mm -hmm. That's how that filter works. So we know it really was a seller carry. It was an installment sale under the IRS code for an installment sale. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So next up, we've got 
what do we think is going to happen in 2022? Oh. <laughs> well, what do you think your interest rates are doing? We all know that, right? Yeah. yeah. Up they um, go. So, so the question real quick was that, you know, are you, are licenses required to create notes? <laughs> it's a broad genre question. I know we had a, uh, we had back, I guess last August, we had a debt license company come on and talk about well, buying debt, but to create these notes, are licenses required? Well, I'm not an attorney and I don't play <laughs> one on TV. I will uh, share with you that the biggest concern most people have on creating a seller finance note is whether it has to be Dodd-Frank compliant. So we back up, well, what's Dodd-Frank? Yeah. So Dodd-Frank came in to protect consumers from what they considered was predatory lending, people charging unfair prices and interest rates and setting them up to fail in their repayment of their loan, giving them a loan they couldn't even afford. Mm -hmm. So when they did all of that, they did include some seller financing, but not all seller financing. Mm -hmm. So first of all, they said, uh, if you're selling to an investor, not an owner that's going to occupy the property, doesn't, doesn't, it's not included. So that's the first thing. When we all saw Dodd Frank hit, we're like, oh, we'll just do investor deals. But, you know, quickly that inventory dried up. So we're like, yeah. okay, we got to get, got to figure this out. So then, so then they said, um, and I'm just paraphrasing this. It's not to substitute for your own legal counsel, but I'm just sort of paraphrasing. And then it said that you could do one in 12 months and be exempt if you were an individual, if you did sell to an owner that was also going to live in the property. Okay. And then they said you could do three or less if you were an entity and the owner lived in the property, as long as you didn't do certain things. It had to amortize, it had to do this, it had to do that. And they had to have the ability to repay. Mm -hmm. So the ability to repay means that the people can afford to make the payment, so that they make enough money to make the payment. And so most people now, if they are doing this professionally, they're going to have the buyer fill out a credit application and verify their income and see how much of bills they have compared to what they make and do a, a debt to income ratio. And so this, if you're doing a lot of seller financing more than one in 12 months I to buyers that are living in the property, we always suggest you go to somebody like calltheunderwriter.com so, they'll charge less than five hundred dollars to help so you. if you are interested in doing that me and nathan actually interviewed them uh, a few months back a few months back it's not expensive to do it's not it's extremely easy you can charge the borrower for all the costs yes it's like 200 bucks to get started it totaled less than 500 bucks it's a great way to put yourself out there and make sure you're holding yourself accountable because the ability to repay is so vague let the professionals who work on this on a daily basis, who run to hurdles, tell you what the situation is. And it's really easy, guys. So definitely rewind, go to YouTube or whatever, Facebook group, whatever, or LinkedIn, and just take a look at it. So yeah. yes, call the underwriter nationwide service. There are a few other ones. I think our portal has other resources, but call the underwriter is the most common one we'll work with. They work in a exactly. lot of almost all the states, whereas the other ones tend to be regional. There's tons yeah. of them in Texas, obviously, because there's so much seller financing. So yeah, that that is a that's what we recommend if you're doing more than one in 12 months. Shoot, I recommend it if you're only doing one in 12 months, just mm -hmm. because you'll have the safety of mind to know that that buyer borrower can qualify. Sure. Plus, they'll have the ability to pull a credit report so you can see what kind of credit history they have paying their other bills. And they'll send out all the necessary disclosures and they package it up and they make it look all pretty, just almost like a bank loan, except you get to make the decision on whether you feel that person is qualified to, to buy or borrow against the property. And, and so that you get to decide the debt to income ratios. And the other reason we suggest it is because if you ever go to resell your note on the secondary market, it looks more like a, tra a traditional transaction. It will qualify for better pricing if you ever go to resell it. So it's to me, it's a no-brainer. Even if you know what you're doing, you've done it for 30 years like me, I still want to use a professional because I want them to package it all up. And like you said, you got that third-party validation of whether it meant that ability to repay. So it, it now has a simple solution. So yeah, I mean, uh, we transact seller finance notes. You just got to make sure you're following the, the, the most. And then there's some states have their own version of the SAFE Act. 
So I would be remiss not at least mentioning that as well. That is similar to usually something in Dodd-Frank. So know that in your state as well, if you're gonna be a repeat seller financing. And then there's a point where you do enough of them, then you might be uh, considered truth and lending under TILA that you might need an actual a mortgage loan originator license, but most of us do less than that or make sure we do less in any one entity to be sure that that- If you get that big, you're, you're gonna know that know. you need to yeah. do it and <laughs> that you know, you're gonna avoid it if you choose to, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah. So I think I think we did a good job altogether answering yeah. that, right? Without being legal advice. Okay, all right. So what's happening in 2022? Well, interest rates are on the rise. When interest rates go up, payments go up. When payments go up, less people qualify. Yeah. It's harder to get financed right now. Uh, it, it just is. I just saw, read a big article on how arms are coming back because people can't afford the payment without an arm. And so it's like, mm -hmm. oh, 08. I feel like 08 all over, but okay. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. I'm just. Oh, we're missing oh, right now. The yeah, I know. I know. So there's inflation, there's uncertainty. Uh, people don't know what's going on with the war and things like that. Uh, yeah. So we believe. Um, and the only piece that's keeping all of this afloat, I think, is supply and demand. So we keep seeing property values go up because yeah. there's so much demand and so little supply. And a lot of markets have less than one month of supply. And they say it's six months or more, right, to be an even market. So that's what's keeping everything going right now, in my opinion. Uh, but even if prices keep going up, just by fact that it's harder to get traditional financing, is the reason that I think we're seeing an increase in seller financing. So this is from the Mortgage Bankers Association at mba.org. This is conventional lending. They track what they call the Mortgage Credit Availability Index. And Whoa. you can see that uh, it was very prevalent. When that, when that number is high, when that graph is high, money is really easy to get from the banks to buy a home. And when the number's down uh, below that 100, basically, it's harder. And I drew a green line across where we are right now compared to where we were in the past. Mm -hmm. So you can see in about 2020, when COVID hit, uh, the banks pulled back and they started making it harder to get a loan to buy a house. And we see every time the interest rates pop up, the mortgage availability also pops down. And so we predict that mortgage availability as interest rates will rise will continue to go down. Mm -hmm. And as mortgages from banks are less available, then seller financing usually comes in and takes up the slack and picks up the difference. And so right now we are tracking about the same kind of mortgage availability as we were in 2014 for reference. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So I did one more thing. Last chart, I promise. Because uh, we could geek out on these numbers forever, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I laid them side by side <laughs> just because I want people to think that when mortgage availability is low, seller financing is high. And when mortgage availability is high, seller financing gets lower. So I predict, I don't have a crystal ball, but I predict that like last year I predicted we'd see the same or less in seller financing in 2021. Here we saw more. Right now, I think the signs are clear that we will see more because of the interest rates um, going up predominantly. And, and like you said, the only thing keeping everything afloat here is the supply yeah. It's not going to last forever. Yeah. So I am I putting in the link for the uh, MBA um, inside the chats for everyone. So you can look at that. So you can look at these cha charts yourself and kind of get an idea where, um, you know, you think there are in comparison. You can see it month after month where it's at. Um, understand that, you know, the MBA is a big, big place, right? They, they do a lot of data. They do a lot of stuff. Um, and they also host web uh, conferences as well. We actually have our the NBA conferences on our portal. And if you want to attend them, they're a higher level of information, right? They're not the basic knowledge. Take a look at this stuff. The biggest charts are where she's showing you here, as well as charts where it deals with like the income, right? And that's another chart to look at is how is income compared to house values? And that if anyone watched Big Short, you'll see that that's part of the movie is <laughs> What is the, how much people are making compared to what house values are? We're now past the threshold again. Like we were back in 06, 07, 08. That's indication to us 
And we're not sure exactly what's going to break. We're not sure what's going to put that door. But when you walk around like they did back when we did back then and say, it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. We know something's coming around the corner. Yeah, when the average median income can't afford the average median house, that's when your market's out of whack. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be another great chart to pull up next. Is yeah. If anybody wants to see the stats, yeah. they're welcome to download the report at nodeinvestor.com uh, forward slash stats, or you can just go to our homepage. It's there on our homepage and yeah. uh, it's it's free to download that. Yeah. Um, so we, I love doing the stats. You can, there's a lot of valuable information there if you're a marketer uh, or if you're somebody creating seller finance. We talk about on our website, uh, how to create a seller finance note. If you wanted to resell it for top dollar, what are the best terms and rates and borrower credit and that sort of thing? Because, uh, you know, I'll look at a note and there's some notes I can pay 50 cents on the dollar for and some I can pay 95 cents on the dollar for. And that all has to do with how they were created and, yeah. you know, the buyer's credit and how many months of seasoning. But I'm talking a brand new note. There's that much difference just based on how it was created. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Cindy said thank you that uh, you and Fred are rock stars, of course. Oh, thanks. Um, you know, one of the conferences, there's been a lot of conferences, of course, lately. Uh, I didn't go to the NBA one and the DME one, um, but I wanted to see, are you be going to paper source at all? Um, or you'd be going to conferences moving forward that people can also see you as well there? Yeah, yeah. Well, we did IMN and DME. We're and not making it to paper source. I'm sorry. It's a great conference. It's good. Uh, we, I know there's a... Uh, Realty IQ has got an online conference coming up I'll be speaking at. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I will be, we definitely go out to Quest Expo in Houston. That's a great conference. Uh, it talks about a lot of investing in notes and real estate through your self-directed retirement account. Uh, we always go out to Note Expo as well. And then Fred yep. and I host our virtual online convention every year. Cashflow Expo. I know you guys have spoke. Thank you. And yeah. we also do Wise Women Expo. So those are the ones we've got coming up right now. Uh, there's a lot of conferences this year because yeah, everybody was making up, up for it after COVID. I'm going to have right? to add Quest on to our, our, our portal note conferences. We have a whole list of them. If you're curious about what's coming up, feel free to jump on the portal uh, note conferences. I'll do a quick share so you guys can see what, what I'm talking about. But it, it's yeah. the idea of getting involved, being <laughs> active, right? Um, so as you can see here, we actually have a lot of stuff on here already. Um, and you can obviously see what's going on and see what's happening, what's coming up. Get involved, ask questions. If you're not familiar with it, ask us. Hey, listen, has anyone gone to this conference? Has anyone looked at this conference? And it's a good way to kind of get involved. You can see the dates coming up. You can see where they're going to be, the link right for them. Right? And I'm trying to add them as we come along. Um, me and Nathan will be speaking at Paper Source. Uh, yeah. That's coming up just literally in less than a month. Um, so definitely jump in and, and, and ask questions. If you see a conference coming up that we don't have on here, let us know about it too, right? So Tracy, with all this information, you know, it looks very attractive for seller financing, right? This idea of getting a hold of these billions of dollars of notes it seems easy. Is it that easy? It's hard to market to them. So I tell people, I like, if you like that market, you have to approach it two ways. You, I can either associate with someone who's out there marketing for that paper and you can buy it on that secondary level, or you can get in there and market direct to them. I think it just depends on how much time and energy you want to, to put towards it. Uh, so the other way is that you could be a seller financier yourself. You could buy a property with the intent of just turning around and selling it on seller financing and wrap it and make a difference on the spread. So you create your own notes, or maybe you want to market just to those multi-sellers. That's a different approach where you just want to reach out to the people who are doing a lot of these notes and just be their source to replenish their capital. You could either lend mm -hmm. against them, you could buy a partial, maybe you could buy the whole note. Yeah. So you kind of have to decide where you want to play in that because going after that 
it, mom and pop who just created one. It's a time intensive uh, venture because you've either you've got to do direct mail or Google ads or SEO or outbound marketing. Uh, you can you have to realize that not all of them want to sell and some of them want to sell, but they need curative work done to their documentation because it's next to, you know, a napkin on a diner. <laughs> yes. Close, close to that. Uh, <clears throat> some of them won't like the price and won't sell. So uh, some of them you have to nurture for one or two years. So it goes from the beginning of getting the data, which isn't easy to do, right? To getting the data and trying to get a hold of these people, like right? reaching out to banks, same idea. Then if you get a hold of them, you have to educate them Mm -hmm. understand time value, right? Um, you know, I love your talk about the fact that due to 50, 50, 25, 25 seems so much more easier to teach them that than time value, but the whole process. And then when you get them to agree on a price, you have to cure the, the collateral file because it could be all over the place. Oh, like is the there no, I don't know. Yeah. It's not for the faint of heart. I will say you get better profits. That's Absolutely. So you the get returns are ridiculous. That. Yeah. You get paid yeah. for that effort. Yeah. So, yeah. If yeah. anyone has any questions, Tracy's been around for a long time. Check out our little website. This will be replayed on YouTube and Facebook group and our, our, our the podcast as well. Um, it's amazing this information and, and being aware of it, right? This $23 billion created last year. And you figure it's 100 and whatever, uh, you know, 20, 123 billion in the last five years. This is a market that's available out and ready to go. And a majority of it is a one owner one creator note, which means that those people are not the big bulk sellers, that mm -hmm. they're probably more apt to selling than these bigger banks who are looking to say, listen, I don't want to sell or whatever reason. These mm -hmm. are mom and pops for some unknown reason. They want to sell property. <laughs> And because, there's lots of reasons. Because the buyer or the property didn't qualify. <laughs> That's most likely it. Yeah. Especially in Texas, there's some people out there who can't get loans uh, or the fact that they don't want to create a loan for a low value property. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. So. What were you going to say, Nathan? Sorry. I was just going to say there's, and, and for this notes, the note holders, there's lots of reasons they want to sell. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be as simple as, wait, I can get a chunk of money right now. Hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. You know, and, and that can be used for anything, yeah. whatever they've got. You know, kids going to college, uh, they want to go on vacation, they're doing renovations on their own home. I mean, you choose, you know, there's there are, um, tons of different reasons. They want to get into crypto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 they or they, they know the person too well and it's, mm. it's awkward. That's a when lot they of times yet. Mm. Yeah. So, and one last thing is that when you're experienced buying these seller financing, do you have more success buying a partial from these people or buying the whole thing? I know mean, that's a big conversation piece. I try to buy a partial on every deal, but <laughs> some of them will only sell. They'll say, if I'm going to sell, I'm only going to sell it all because I want the peace of mind. Yeah. So I always offer a full and a partial. And I always explain to them why the partial is a better deal because they're selling the most valuable payments and how much they're going to get back at the end. And they can yeah. always sell some more payments later. So I try, but um, some of them will only sell because in their mind, the discount's worth it if they can just be rid of the problem. So you have to go with what serves their needs and yeah. desires the most, but I always give them the problem. option because partial is better for all of us, not just me, yeah. but for them too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, guys, feel free to reach out to Tracy, uh, you know, and ask questions and curiosity, stuff like that, because it's a big deal, the seller finance world. It's different from the bank originated, you know, uh, institutional loans out there, Fannie and Freddie loans. It's a new world, new market. It's awesome. Um, so I hope that you guys learn some value of stuff. The data here is attractive to most of us. Yeah. Um, and it's really cool. That's fascinating. Thanks so much, Tracy. Yeah. This has been Thank great. you so I much. Yeah. I appreciate Thanks for having your time. me on. Thanks for all you guys do. It's a great group and I appreciate oh, your time. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. Thanks so